Shabbat Shalom Chavrim. It is a pleasure to get to speak with you on this uh, Sabbath evening. And I don't know exactly how we're going to go with this message here, but I think it'll be a blessing to you. It's something that I wanted to share, um, kind of like a highlight of the different revelations that God has given me over the years here. Some of these things, those of you that are newer to listening to this ministry, have maybe have not heard, maybe you've not gone back and listened to some of the older videos. I believe there's like close to 700 videos out there. And um, so I just thought I would share, kind of compile it. And at the same time, this is kind of what the book uh, that I'm writing now, Moses, A Prophet Likened Unto Me. Um, the name of the book is Moses. And then I quote the, the subtitle as A Prophet Likened Unto Me, where looking at the different prophetic insights throughout the scripture that identify Yeshua as being the Messiah. And so I've, I've, I've compiled, I'm compiling those in the book. And of course, there's many of them I forgot. I have to go back and listen to the videos myself. And, uh, but there's, I just thought I would share uh, a bunch of these with you that I can remember off the top of my head this evening. And, uh, and if you know someone Jewish, maybe it might be a blessing to them as well. Let's get started. I like to go right, because uh, one of the first places that God really dealt with me on is actually the story of Joseph, but we're going to skip to the book of John uh, in the Christian Bible, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, I kind of start here because this, is, this was the one that really got my attention early on. Because John, I noticed his revelation was very interesting. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And I remember going back, and I was searching. I'm, I'm like, gosh, in the beginning, that's Bereshit, at the first, literally, in Hebrew. But it's what we would call the beginning or Genesis, as you say in English. And I thought, what is the first word that God spoke? Because John notices in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word becomes the light of men. So let's take a look at that. And is one of the greatest revelations that I believe the Lord ever showed me there. And we start off in Genesis uh, chapter 1. And I'll just start right here at the very verse beginning. At the first God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, no, there was no, nothing to it. Alright, now the darkness was upon the face uh, 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 of, of, the, of the deep, you might say, and uh, uh, the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters. All right, that's where we are there now. So let's pick back up here. Okay, and then here comes the clincher. Because I was looking to see where's the first time God speaks himself that you can say, oh, and God said. And it was that next verse. Ve'yomer Elohim. And God, he said, Yahi or. Ve'yahi or. And God said, let there be. Now we say the word, let there be. Let there be light. But that is not just let there be. That is eternity coming into existence so that the light can what? Can be the fellowship or the light of men so that God can have fellowship with his creation. Remember, God is invisible. God, as we would say, God the Father is an invisible God. And Christ is the is, is the expressed image. He is God himself manifest in a human being. You understand? So the Son of God is, uh, we see, is, was there in the beginning. And John said that he was the light of men. In the beginning was God, was the Word, and the Word was with God. So that first word was light. So John was right on it when he said, in him was life, and the life was the Light of men, because God says, Ve'yome Elohim Yahior. And God said, Let there be light. Wow, it's incredible. So, God, the light, and the light was the life of men. Now, and the other great revelation was the fact that when God takes and He breathes into the nostrils of Adam, we see Him forming 
Adam from the dust of the earth, which remember I said to you yesterday about when Yeshua was on earth, he takes the blind man that goes to the pool of Siloam, he takes and spits on the ground till he makes a clay puddle, makes the, takes that spit and turns it into clay, see? And he forms that clay, puts it on his eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. What was, what was Christ doing? He was showing he was the same God in Genesis that took and formed Adam from the dust of the ground. But interestingly enough, see, the, the life is the light of men. And what did, what did God do in the beginning to Adam when he first formed him from a clay figure? The Bible says in Hebrew, He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Ipach pa'av nishmat chayim. Chayim is the word life in a plural form. And he does it in a plural because why? He created both, he created them, them, male and female created he, them, okay? And he called their name Adam. So Adam and Eve, as we would know them, were, in, were contained in the self-same body. Adam comes from word, the word Adama, which is ground in Hebrew. And Eve Chava is not even, she's not even given the name Chava to begin with. She's given that after the fall. But before the fall, God calls her Isha. And he calls Adam Ish. Now, the rabbis have always known that it is from a compound, this word Ish and Isha both comes from a compound word. It is Aleph Yod Shin for Ish, which is what the man is called, which is from the word fire. Aleph and Sheen, and they're in the middle of his name, the Yod, is the first letter for the divine name of God. Isha, his wife, who is inside of him, her, hers is spelled Aleph, Sheen, He, and the first two, of course, are, is the fire or the light, the light of God, the light of men. And the last letter in her name is the He, which taking the Yod and the He, now we have Yah, we have God written right there in their names. They were the light of men. Now, God, when he breathes in there, he breathes not only the light, but the life into them. And that life, as John said, was in him was life, and the life was the light of men, mankind in this case here. So he doesn't have to breathe Nishmat Chaim again. The Chaim is the tree of life, which it also identifies that if he was the life, he is the tree of life that's there in the Garden of Eden. It is Christ. What is the tree of life? It's the olive tree, of course, because he is typed in the Bible as the olive tree. So the olive tree or Christ that is there, the tree of life, in Hebrew we call that Eitz Chaim, is there in the midst of the garden. And that tree of life breathes in Adam and Eve the life and they become living souls and they are called Ish and Isha, which literally is the life or the fire or the light of Almighty God. Incredible revelations there that the Lord first shared with me there. And then we, we see things all the way down through the scripture. Another wonderful one that I saw was in the story of Joseph. Joseph so mirror the type, uh, or mirrored Christ's life. But there were certain things that the Lord revealed to me that were uh, beyond that what you hear most scholars speak about. I mean, everybody knows that he was sold out for 30 pieces of silver, much like Joseph was sold as well. And uh, he was thrown in the ditch, supposing to be dead. All of these, we hear these types here. But the one thing that really got me is when his brothers come to find out who they're, who, to, 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 to buy the corn, and Joseph's been exalted. He's fed the entire Gentile world, which shows that the Jews will come back at the very end. They never get it while, the whole time they don't get it. They, they, they did not recognize him to be their true brother, just like Yeshua was never recognized. We know that. And they rejected him. He sold out. He goes to the Gentiles, feeds the entire world. And then when the Jews finally return to get the food, you know, they realize they need the bread of life as well. He puts that, he puts that meal in their bag, accuses them of spies first. Why? He's got to bring them to a place of repentance. But he puts the meal in their bag, puts their money back in the sack. Why? The bread of life is a gift. It's a free gift of God, and you cannot purchase eternal life. That's one reason why he puts it back in their bag. But on their way to the uh, back home, they stop at an inn at a hotel. Malone in Hebrew is what it's called, a hotel. 
And that's when the first one of the brothers find that his money is returned to his sack when he opens it to go to feed their, their donkey there. And when he does, he's troubled greatly and they remembered what they did to Joseph. And of course, this is symbolic as well because the first place that Christ was ever rejected was when he was in his mother's womb. Joseph was looking for a proper place to, to have, uh, for, for Mary to have Jesus, Yeshua. And he goes to a hotel, and there's no place found for him in the inn, and they send him to a barn. Because why? He was a lamb of God. Lambs are born in stables, not in hotels. But the point is, is that in the story of Joseph, they, they recognize this first because it was the first place he was rejected. Then we see Joseph sends them down the second time to buy food. Food. This time he sends Benjamin because he already hears about what's going on down there and he's worried that he's going to be bereaved of his second son. And of course they go back down. Benjamin, while they have this nice supper and everything, before he reveals himself to him, he does something kind of strange. Joseph takes and puts his cup in Benjamin's bag. That's kind of interesting. And why does he do this? Because God was showing Israel for a future. This is for you, my Jewish brothers. The whole story of Joseph, not just the typical things that you're used to seeing, but the whole story of Joseph was, is, is set in symbology, letting us know who the Messiah would really be. And Joseph put his cup in Benjamin's bag for a couple of reasons. One, because Christ would be rejected. The greater Joseph would be rejected at the communion table. That would be one. Secondly, he put it in Benjamin's bag, the innocent brother, and that signifies two different things. One, the Jews of today were not the Jews there that condemned him 2,000 years ago. And so therefore the innocent brother gets the cup, showing that the innocent brother today has to make a decision, what will he do with this cup that is now in his hand? Secondly, it signified that the Benjamites would not be so innocent 1,500 years after this particular story, because why? The Benjamites would be the ones that rejected him as part of the house of David. The house of Israel has already gone into captivity, but the house of Judah, the house of Benjamin, and the Levites were all there, and they all three rejected Yeshua, and the Benjamites were calling for his blood. Just like in the story of David, another great revelation that the Lord led, led me to as well. In the story of David, we see the same thing. Yeshua sits on the Mount of Olives. He weeps over Jerusalem and said, How often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood. But you would not. He said, Your house is left to you desolate until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you know, David did something very similar to that. When he was rejected of his own people, when his son, his very son, Absalom, his name literally in Hebrew means Absalom, my father is peace. And he does not recognize nor have the revelation that David is the anointed king of Israel. But he lifts himself up as if he's someone. But David, he could have put the coup down. He had the great warriors among him. But he didn't do it. Remember what happened with Jesus' followers? With the disciples, when they come to take Jesus by force, Peter took the sword out, cut off the ear of that high priest's servant. Yeshua said, put away your sword, Peter. He said, could I not call my father ten legions of angels he delivered to me right now? See, David, the same thing. His man said, we'll take care of this right now if you just say the word, David. He said, no, we won't cause that bloodshed. But when David leaves, he leaves behind ten concubines. That was kind of interesting, wasn't it? He said, care for my house while I'm gone. Those ten concubines were represented as the ten virgins in the Christian story that we read there. Five are wise, five are foolish. But nonetheless, the ten virgins are representative of true believers, true Gentile, or true, true Gentile believers in this day that would believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And they were left behind to do what? David said, care for my house in my absence. And so the Gentiles were given the charge to care for Israel in his absence. And of course, Absalom, he has abused them very much so publicly and right before everyone's eyes. Well, it's no different. It's exactly what, it's exactly what uh, has happened with the Jews to the Christian people today. 
Then again, we can understand why in some regards, though, too, because the so-called Christian people, the Catholic Church and different other organizations that have hated the Jews down through the ages have murdered and killed the Jews on the name of religion. But the true Christians have always stood by them, that true ten concubines. And I say concubines is because why? A concubine is a, a wife that has not had a proper marriage as of yet. And of course, the bride of Christ is still to be married. So it's another interesting part. And then, of course, we have the part, again, going back to Benjamin, and Benjamin being the one with the cup in his bag, we find that Shimei, very interesting story with David, Shimei is the very guy that takes, and when David leaves after he weeps over Jerusalem, he weeps over Jerusalem as well, with his head covered. And he leaves Jerusalem, and when he does, as he's going along, Shimei meets him. He's one of the tribe of Benjamin, interestingly enough, spitting on him and saying, you, have, you are nothing but a curse. You took and robbed the kingdom from Saul. Well, David's men were ready to kill him too. But David said, let him alone. The Lord has told him to do this. The same thing with Yeshua. He was spit on, what? By the Benjamites. Rejected by the Benjamites. They said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, they meant it in a derogatory sense, just like Joseph's brothers meant it in a derogatory sense as well, when they decided to take and kill one of their own lambs and pour the blood upon Joseph's coat to go and lie to their father and say, tell us, is this your son's coat or no? And of course, when Jacob saw it, he wept bitterly. He said, yes, it is my son's coat. But yet Joseph bore in his body the iniquity of his brethren, like the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. The sacrificial goat by his brothers was killed, placed on his coat, and God accepted that sacrificial goat that was offered by Joseph's brothers as a sacrifice for their sins, else God would have killed them. And Joseph became the scapegoat. In this case, Yeshua played both scapegoat and sacrificial goat. And when they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, they, like Joseph's brothers, meant it in a derogatory sense. But God applied that blood in a supernatural sense and pardoned them for their iniquities. And we see this in the story of Joseph, his brothers found mercy, as well as in the story of Shemai. What happens after David leaves and his men and they cross the river Jordan, just like Christ, he crossed the river Jordan. He says to Israel, your house is left desolate. What does he mean by desolate? He's not talking about a destruction of the temple. He's talking about them personally, their own houses, those that would not believe that he was that Lamb of God that was the rock, Christ Jesus, that came to give the waters of life for eternal life to them, to be born again, as he told Nicodemus. That water of life that was in him was that new birth. It was the tree of life, as we mentioned earlier, the eighth Chaim. But they should have got it, and they didn't get it. Well, anyway, David crossed, this, David crossed the river, and while David is gone, he sends two witnesses back, two priests and their sons. But we only see the mention of the two priests. And they go back, and he says, let me know what's going on. Much like God will do it at the very end, you have two witnesses. Now, in another place, David says, have the people all in one mind and one accord so that I can return. This is exactly what Yeshua is looking for, according to Zechariah 12. And it is an inter interesting, in Zechariah 12, when they look upon the one whom they have pierced, and they mourn for him as a family that lost their only son, the Bible says they separate each one to his own family, the house of David apart and his wives apart, the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the house of Shemai apart and their wives apart, the house of Levi and their wives apart. And when it names the family, it does not name them in tribal order. But if you look at the family names, David, Nathan are from the tribe of Judah, Shemai again from the tribe of Benjamin, and of course the Levites are the Levites. What is it? God in Zechariah says he gathers the house of Judah first so that they do not exalt themselves above uh, Israel. So everything is falling into perfect place. The so Shemai, in the story of David, Shemai, when David is coming back and does cross the river, they, his servants wanted to kill him. Much like the Christians think that the Jews should be killed today. Many Christians have the wrong idea about the Jews. They say, well, they don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, so therefore they should just be wiped off the earth. 
Well, David's men had that kind of same idea as well. But David said, no man shall die this day today. And he had mercy on Shimei. In fact, Shimei was the very one that met him at the river first, pleading for mercy. Because why? He had finally recognized that Yeshua indeed was the Messiah. Well, if that wasn't enough, so many other things that, that the Lord has revealed as well, things that we should have seen as Jews. Why did we not see these things? You know, it's even like, for example, if we, if we look at, if we look at the time of when Yeshua was, was dying and on the cross, when they put him on the tree, why was he put it on, uh, on the tree? As the Bible says, cursed he that hangs on the tree, because he was a tree. He is a tree of life. He is that fruit. He was on that cross because he represented the tree of life. Now, we're going to go into that in just a second, but I want to share some other little tidbits here that are just beautiful. And one is the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns is prophesied. As Jews, we should have saw the part about the crown of thorns, if for no other reason from the very part of the scripture where the Bible says to Moses, when God met Moses at the burning bush. In Hebrew, that word burning bush we know is a thorn bush. Sinai is a thorn bush. And from the midst of the thorn bush, it says God, it was Hashem himself speaking through right out of the midst of the bush. The angel of his presence was the light. It was the pillar of fire. That was the angel of his presence. In other words, the form in which he had taken on. Okay, now, here it was, Christ was sitting there on, or, or hanging on a cross. They put a crown of thorns upon him. They even smote him on the head before they put him on the cross. They said, speak. But when he did speak in that unknown tongue, there God was in the midst of the thorn bush, speaking once again to the children of Israel. What about the prophecy in Psalms? I forget exactly which Psalm it is, uh, where it says that he is the lily among the thorns. That's exactly right. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star root and offspring of David, but the lily among the thorns showing where we would find him. Another one, Hosea 2, 6, where God says to Israel, I will hedge up your way with thorns. See, the, the children of Israel, ever since we were, ever since Adam and Eve were, were pushed out of the Garden of Eden, we wanted to know how to get back to the tree of life. That's the eternal life. That is, that is really what being born again is. This is why Yeshua was so surprised with Nicodemus when he didn't know how to be born again. He didn't understand the concept. He said, you're a master of Israel and you do not understand these things? To being born again? Why? Because if we're born of a natural life, there has not been any breath of life breathed into us by the tree of life, the Es Chaim. God has not breathed that breath of life, or the Holy Spirit, as Christians would speak about it today, has not been breathed into you. Because that way was guarded until redemption was brought forth. And that's exactly what God's prophesies in Hosea 2.6. He says, the way of the tree of life, let me pull that up for you. The way of the tree of life, because um, it's a really, really good one here. And he says here, for, for their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers. Now, by the way, this is where God is using Hosea to show how Israel is going to, to act. Okay? For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. Wow. The way to the tree of life was guarded by God. And she goes after her lovers for what? Water, wool, flax, oil, drink. Well, you know, look at these right here. God is the one that gives it. He says, think not what you shall wear or what you shall drink or eat. He says, for your Father in heaven careth for these things. What about the water? He is the water of life. 
He is the rock. Remember when Moses takes and at Meribah and the children of Israel are chiding against Moses and everything, said, you brought us out here to all die. Now, they had only been, what, two, three months into the journey already. They had seen the Red Sea parted and everything, all the miracles down in Egypt that they saw. And God had spared them and separated between them. And now they're complaining because they don't have water. Well, see, God knew what he was doing. God was setting up signs for Israel all along the way, things to teach us what to look for so we would know when the Messiah comes. So they chided with Moses. They said, whether or not, you know, is God among us or not? Same thing they did when Yeshua come. Is God among us or not? But isn't it interesting? God says to Moses, take the elders of Israel and go out, Aaron with you, the Levite, and smite the rock. Do you know Aaron was among those speaking against Moses at that time? Because when God takes Aaron's life, God says this is why he takes his life and won't allow him to go into the promised land because he withstood Moses at that time as well. Showing that the Levites would not believe Yeshua when he come. And they would take the elders of Israel and they would judge him. And Moses would smite him, showing that Moses, because Moses, God told Moses, you shall be God and Aaron shall be your prophet. So like a type of God, God smote Christ on that mountain. And when he smote that rock, which that rock represented Christ, the water came forth in a huge abundance. It was showing that the only way that the, that the life, the eighth Chaim that was in the Garden of Eden could be restored back, the only way they could get a new birth was for the rock to be judged by Israel, rejected by Israel, and then be stricken by Israel so that he could be opened up. This is what he did with the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? He comes to her and he says, if you knew it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink. I'd give you water. You don't have to come here anymore. And she said, sir, uh, the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. And, but, but then she wanted to know, give me this water that I don't come here to drink anymore. He was giving her a sign to look for. He says, I'll give you that water that flows from the valley. And when he was on Calvary and the Roman soldier pierced his side and the water and the blood separated from his side, it was a direct testimony that he was the rock. He gave her the sign to look for. I'll give you water. I believe she was probably there the day that he was crucified and saw that water come forth. And when that water came forth, it allowed the life that was inside of him because he was the tree of life. The Bible says, John says, he was the life and the life was what? The light of men. What's he do after his resurrection? He comes along and he breathes on his apostles and he says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Again, he was identifying who he was because he breathed on Adam and both Adam and Eve both received the Holy Spirit. We know this because nowhere does the scripture ever say that God had to breathe into Eve's nostrils the breath of life. She was filled with the Holy Spirit as well because why? God breathed it in a multiple form inside of the body of Adam and then taken from Adam and it literally says in Hebrew, he took from Ish, from the fire of Yahweh and he made Isha. That's how we know that she was filled with the Spirit of God. And we see this beautiful type and parallel also in John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a representation of Eve coming from the mother's womb filled with the Holy Spirit. John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his own mother's womb. See? Adam was like, like a mother, so to speak, of Eve because God takes her from him. Not that he's her mother. We know that. Because, but you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Just to give you a little bit of an analogy here. And, and, and just, gosh, there's been so many. Uh, mm. I want to got some more here. I want to just share with you here because, I, like I said, I forget, I forget so many of these. Why did he walk on water? That was another beautiful revelation the Lord showed me one day. I'm sitting there looking at Yeshua walking on the water, and when I did, I remembered the very verse I just read to you a moment ago. Here, what does it say here in Genesis in verse two? Uh, okay, it's without form, without uh, you know, there's there's nothing to it. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit Elohim of God brooded or hovered or walked over the face of the deep. 
See, the very same God that could walk on the water in Genesis was here, walking on the water, showing his disciples who he was. You know, when he took the bread and he fed the 5,000 and he had all, all, all the leftover and everything, he, and, he, and he did the, the bread and the fish, showing that he was the same God. And everybody knows that one anyway, that he was, a, he was the same God that gave that bread to the, to the children of Israel. Now, we know the, the bread comes from the Father. I understand that. I'm not trying to get that mixed up for you. But he's showing you he was the one there. He said, I am that. He, he, he wasn't just there. He was the bread of life because they ate of that bread, and they, they were able to go for 40 years without aging or anything. But that was only a type and shadow to show you that if you ate of the true bread of life, you would never die. Mm. Oh, gosh, praise be to God. It, just so many, so many. Ah. So many, so many different revelations. And, and there's many, many more. I, I, I'm just kind of lost for it for right now to, to think of all the different ones that he's revealed to my heart. But they've been such a blessing. And I trust it's been a blessing for you as well uh, tonight. And May you have a blessed Shabbat. We are going to be doing the message on Shabbat. We said we would do that for you guys. We'll be doing that very soon just to show you how to keep Shabbat. And, uh, and by the way, if you have a place you can go to worship on Shabbat, that is part of it. Because as the Bible said, even Paul, as his custom was, even Yeshua's custom was, every Sabbath they would be teaching in the synagogue. So if you can go, definitely go. It's time of rest. It's a time of refreshing time of refreshing in Him, our great light, our great I Am. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shabbat shalom.